Hello again, folks. Welcome back to not quite the final part of Animals at War, but the final part with my co-host, Lucy Betteridge Dyson. It's been really extraordinary. And I, if you're watching this and wondering what we're going to be talking about, all the shows this week have not been there just because they're cutesy, just because it's our furry, furry friend. They have all been about World War II, the victory in World War II, how everybody came together, the pigeons carrying messages yesterday, the importance of horse transport. So we're not just doing this to try and appeal to a little particular demographic who like yappy things and woofy things and meowing things. It's a, it's serious World War II stuff to tell you, although I've just undermined it by my banal presentation. Of it. Anyway, if you're new to the uh, World War II TV, don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to become uh, consider becoming a patron or YouTube member and follow and uh, our guests on social media, the links of which are in the description below. You can find their books their websites their twitter handles and so on and so forth but i'm gonna bring in my co-host lucy and she'll introduce our guest so here we come so good after evening lucy how are you today i'm good thank you you i'm very good yes yeah, so you have found us another guest for today so to tell me who tell us who you have brought along and what we're going to be talking about tonight lucy yeah, and just before I do, I just want to say, um, you know, thanks for sort of arranging this um, this week of Animals in War, because as somebody who, you know, is really interested in clip-cloppy, nay things, um, <laughs> horses, uh, you know, and working in the subfield of animal history, it's um, a relatively new area of military history. And we do, you know, get a lot of kind of flack because people think that we don't know or understand, you know, or do proper research about military history. And it's just not the case. It's just a different lens. So really appreciate the fact that you, you know, we're trying to help us bring this to, to a wider audience. Um, so tonight, and I know a lot of people this week have been um, mentioning dogs a lot and, and what dogs are up to during the Second World War. And so I'm super excited to introduce Hannah Pulser, who is a PhD candidate at the Kansas State University. And her research is focused on uh, an aspect of dogs in war which you might not think of um, ordinarily and that's uh, Dogs for Defence Inc which was formed during the Second World War um, by civilian dog fanciers and their aim was to convince people to basically enlist their pets for warfare. So this is a really unique area of research. Hannah, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be on this program and as someone who does has always enjoyed kind of the woof woof history, clip clop history. I think being able to combine what I love with World War II history has been just a dream, honestly. Yeah. And and what got you interested in woof woof history? <laughs> so it's actually, so it starts off as a really kind of slightly sad story in that um, the first Christmas break after my master's program, I lost my heart dog to cancer. And, you know, you always have that one special dog that you bond with. And after losing her, I started to kind of think about, you know, what could I do with animals in history? Because I've always loved animals, particularly dogs, even though my recent Twitter feed with my very spoiled cat would probably suggest otherwise. But I started to think about, you know, what could I do with dogs? And that Christmas, my aunt actually gave me a book about a German short-haired pointer named Judy who was the mascot for the SS Grasshopper and was actually captured and held in captivity with her men during the Second World War. And so I started to look and just kind of wonder, you know, what did America do with dogs during the Second World War? Because I'd been aware of what um, other forces did during World War One in terms of animal power, whether it be horses or dogs or pigeons. And so I wanted to kind of look and see, you know, what did we do on the home run for the U.S., what did we do in the battlefield with dogs? And so stumbling upon dogs for defense, it was this really this idea that kind of, I think it still left me awestruck that people would be willing to so freely donate their animals to something like the military, because it's something that would not happen today. But you see in the 1940s, people are so willing to donate their dogs to the war effort because they believe that my dog will help win the war and it will help maybe bring my cousin Jimmy home if Spot goes to war. Yeah. And I, we kind of touched on this um, a bit yesterday with the pigeon fanciers and this idea of, um, you know, it was, I guess it was partly a bit of a propaganda -y thing, but also that the impact that um, animals can have on morale and kind of that idea that it's bringing in the whole society. And we were chatting just briefly before the show and we were saying, actually, you know, the Second World War in particular was just, you know, this was a huge conflict that involved everybody, not just military. So this was really like, you know, really kind of 
backing the civilian population to get behind the war. Um, and I mean, I can't possibly imagine giving Ivy up to the military to fight a war. She would be absolutely useless as well, I'll be honest. <laughs> Um, but it, yeah, it's it's a crazy, crazy concept. And it really goes to show the strength of feeling um, from people who are supporting this war effort, I suppose. So yeah, I'm really excited for your talk. Yeah, and I just want to jump in and say that I think from a Lucy and my point of view coming from the British Isles is that if you were a civilian in Britain, it was very difficult to not be part of the World War II because you were very much in it. There were bombers flying over. You saw the Navy leaving the ports. Your fields were being you know, harvested, so on and so forth. But the USA, as we know, is an enormous place. And if you're in the Midwest somewhere, on a farm somewhere, feeling that you're part of the war effort must have been a little bit tougher than, you know, perhaps if you're at New York, you're seeing ships departing or you happen to be near a factory. But a lot of USA, the war didn't touch them in any real practical way. So I think by, as you'll explain later on, getting your pet dog involved in the war effort was a way for Mr. and Mrs. Jones in the middle of Iowa to feel they are part of it. They are, they're supporting their, their son, their cousin, their brother in Iwo Jima or, or Bataan or El Alamein, wherever it would be. So um, it's, it's an important part for the morale of the country. Anyway, you've come uh, prepared with your PowerPoint, which we'll throw up on the screen now, and you can control us there. Folks, we'll kind of do questions as we go along, I suppose, and we'll just put comments up on screen. Uh, on screen. And Lucy will be jumping in with most of the specialist woof woof questions, and I may be jumping in with some other things that come to me. But I'm going to let Lucy and Hannah mostly handle the uh, the, the, the the animal side of things because my three cats um, would be absolutely useless in any kind of war environment. In fact, I'd be. I think they'd be a burden. I think I'd actually want, prefer to sign them up for the enemy to incapacitate the enemy by having to look after them than actually send them on my own allied side. But that's another story for the day. But over to you, Hannah, to take us through this story. So I think you'll see, Paul, as we go through the presentation, your cats might actually be useful during the war. And so that might make you happy. <laughs> and so to start off, I think anyone who does animal history whether it be military, social, cultural, et cetera, you have a favorite animal that you get attached to. It becomes, maybe it's the one that starts, jumpstarts your research project or the one that when you're just combing through archives, you're like, this is the one that becomes my favorite and the one that I want to learn more about. And so for me, that happened to be Fritzy Gothel. And so Fritzy is an English setter or English Springer Spaniel, depending on how you want to classify the breed. He was born in 1939 in Texas and was adopted by Lewis and Betsy Gutzel around nine weeks old. And so Fritzy spent most of his life in San Antonio, Texas, where the Gutzels were based, as Lewis was in the army and Betsy was a homemaker during the time. Now, when the war broke out, Lewis had to travel, and so Betsy followed him and eventually ended up enlisting as a motor car driver. And so Fritzy is left with a neighbor. Now, if you know anything about English Springers, they're a very high energy breed. They often need some kind of job to do, or they can just be a bit rambunctious if you do not have the good exercise regimen to contain their energy. And unfortunately for the poor neighbors who said, sure, we'll watch Fritzy, Fritzy decided to do a large amount of elaborate escapes. And he kept breaking out of the neighbor's fences. And because of that, Fritzy and his escape tactics well, Fritzy got shipped off to war. Fritzy was donated by Bessie Gussell to Dogs for Defense, believing that the army might be able to control Fritzy and make him a better dog. Because it was a belief that for many of these dog owners, you know, it's like shipping the troubled teen off to military camp. The military will make my dog better. They'll come home better trained and things. But and so Fritzy serves in Italy for about a year and is discharged and comes home on March of 1944. And what was interesting to me was when I was going through Fritzy's archives is that honestly, just the love that the Gussels had for this dog, which is what one of the questions that I got still get frequently when I tell people about my research is people assume that these owners did not love the animals that they donated to the war. Because how could you love something and you're willing to put it in harm's way, especially a creature like a dog that has no ways to communicate and say, you know, no, I don't want to go to the war. But looking through Fritzy's archives, you can see things like his discharge certificate that I have up, all of his licenses recorded, 
um, Bessie actually wrote an autobiography for Fritzy to explain kind of Fritzy's past leading up to getting chipped off the war effort. And when Bessie received him in 1944, if you know anything about the set of breeds, they have long, beautiful, feathery, flowing tails. Well, somehow during this time in the military, Fritzy had an accident and his tail was amputated. So he came home with a little nub nub and Bessie was outraged. She actually wrote the military was like, what did you do to my dog? Because, you know, you amputated his tail. I was not notified. And they're like, we're sorry. We can't tell you what happened to your dog, but just assume that it was fine. And so Fritzy was the one that really kind of spurred me on this research. I was like, you know, I want to be able to see what other dogs were donated. Did other owners have this kind of such big emotional connection to their dogs? like the Guffles did for Fritzy. I think, um, just to jump in, Hannah, so, I mean, I totally understand what you mean about having an animal that really gets you into into researching. And because, you know, for me personally, I'm coming from a place of an animal lover. I grew up with horses and also obviously a military historian. So for me, it was like perfect combination of things, you know, that I'm interested in. And what strikes me about Fritzy's story and, and kind of, I think, where this is going to be going tonight is, Often we kind of think about animals and war as either weapons and tools or as companions. And it seems to me this is kind of maybe somewhere in the middle here because we're talking about animals to which people have an emotional connection, but they're also doing important jobs in the military. So it's it's like a weird mix because you're talking about him and, and how his owners spoke about him almost as if it was a, a son. You know, like, why didn't you notify me that his tail got chopped off or whatever? Mm-hmm. And it's like looking kind of through just the millions of photographs they've taken of Fritzy is he really is featured in their photographs and their family memories as kind of a furry son basically like from what I could see is that at least for what the archives have is that I don't see any photos of the Guthel children so Fritzy became the de facto son possibly until they started to have children of their own and so you can see that emotion in these pictures that I've put up with Bessie and Lewis both with Fritzy and then just how proud they were of him, you know, saving things like his discharge certificate, saving every single license renewal that they did, and his rabies vaccinations and things. You can tell that they really loved this dog. Amazing. And so, yeah, what, what did Fritzy go on to do? What was the process? So um, for when Bessie received him, she had seen the thing that said, you know, we unfortunately cannot tell you what your dog did during its time. But we know at least Fritzi might have been stationed around Italy and for the Italian campaigns. And for dogs stationed in the European theater compared to the Pacific, they were mainly used more as sentry dogs or scout dogs. So you would have had a dog with a handler, normally two handlers, they would have gone in the front and the dog would have been the one responding to any dangers or things, scouting out the area to make sure that it would have been safe for troops to go. And if you're familiar with any of the Italian campaign, you might have been familiar with Chips. And Chips was donated from his owners out of New York and was a scraggly husky mutt. And so Chips is actually probably the most famous World War II dog that we have because of taking hold of an Italian pillbox. And even though he suffered powder burns and things, he ends up pulling out the Italian troops and getting them to surrender. And the neat thing is Chips is actually awarded with the Purple Heart and Silver Star for his bravery. But unfortunately, a few American um, politicians complained and said that, you know, dogs shouldn't earn these type of medals. And so they were taken away. And so unlike what you guys do in Britain with the Dickens Medal, Chips ended up just receiving citations of bravery and certificates and things. And that's what the U.S. government did for all of the dogs that came home. So that Probably just hurts. a biscuit anyway, or you know, a nice treat, you know, a medal. I can't eat a medal, you know. So yeah. A, a nice bowl of something that is favorite dinner would probably be a far, far more appreciated than a bit of metal around its neck. But um, mm-hmm. I'm sure you're going to come to this later, Hannah. But um, it immediately strikes me that if you're signing your do- your dog up for the war effort, how long is that going to be? Because when we talk about human beings going away, if you were in the British Army, you might have been away for four or five years. But a dog, four or five years, that's 
<laughs> half a lifetime. I mean, it's what was was it the same was it during the conflict, or was there an anticipation that they would get a dog back? And if you're early, and if you're going to be covering this later on, just say I'm covering it later on. So um, yeah, I can give you a little bit detail and then elaborate more. <laughs> And so in the beginning, when owners signed their dogs away, they signed the dog away. It said that fall, even after the war's end, the dog would be U.S. property. And then the outrage started. And people were like, well, I want my dog back. And then the founders of Dogs for Defense were like, well, they're donating their pets. Maybe the animal should come back if whenever the war ends. And so eventually questionnaire given to owners for Dogs for Defense was um, marked with a little survey that said, do you want your dog back at the war's end? And as you can imagine, most people said yes. <laughs> and so one thing that I try to stress to people is that looking at Dogs for Defense is that how we view our animals, especially our relationship with them today, it's come a long way. And so for America, who seems to obviously quite be frequently lagging behind Britain in things in terms of looking at like animal care and stuff. And so for America, especially white, middle class, upper class America, the idea of pets, the idea is that you would keep an animal simply for companionship really did not start until the late 19th century. And so you see the concept of the pet being established with the um, rise of this idea of humane education for children and the belief that if you bring something fuzzy into the home to raise alongside your child or if parents are viewed nurturing animals in a kind and humane way it will stop your child from being a little hellion when they grow up and it was the belief that if you raise children and animals alongside each other the child will go along to develop the christian path of life meaning they won't go into any vices such as drinking gambling premarital sex or prostitution if they're women. So animals really rose along this idea of the domestic sphere, which the home became much more of a forefront. It became the parent's idea to not only allow the child to be a child, meaning that play was encouraged. They were encouraged to play with their friends, play with animals, but the belief that bringing animals in would allow children to grow into their own beings that nurtured and were nurturing through ideas of kindness that only an animal brought. And when the United States entered the Great Depression, you see the shift from large animal livestock veterinary care into small animal care. And the reason for that is because during the Depression, just the massive loss of large animal clients and livestock due to farmers having to basically kill their herds to be able, or losing their herds because either because of drought, disease, or simply not having the money to upkeep them, veterinarians realized that, hey, these previously kind of stupid animals that we thought that only brought companionship, this is honestly where the money is right now. And so you begin to see more courses being developed in the veterinary field for small animal medicine. You see things such as spaying and neutering being slowly encouraged and veterinarians learning how to spay and neuter animals or learning how to give vaccinations for companion animals. And you see, you begin to see the pop-up clinics and things become established first in urban cities, but then slowly creeping out into rural cities. And so once you get into World War II, you see this idea of the modern pet really kind of established. You see children saving up money to buy their dogs biscuits with their allowances or people spending money on rubber dog toys and things. And I think the funnest thing that Lucy might also be able to kind of chime in on in terms of researching pet history is that this idea of dressing up your pet didn't just start in the 20th century, but it started in the 1800s to mid 1850s with Victorians wanting to buy their cat or dog, these elaborate little fancy outfits and things. And so I think for me, being able to study pet history it's fun to see the parallels from what beginners in pet history. You've muted your, yourself, Hannah. Um, just to kind of pick up on what Hannah was talking about there um, regarding uh, like researching and finding um, animals with 
with clothing and, and such like. One of the great things about animal history is that oftentimes when you're researching them, you realize that actually it's a reflection of uh, human history. So you start to see these parallels with um, basically the things that we learn and the things that we develop, whether it's looking after childcare um, or whether it's just how we have evolved and, and developed society really to care for each other, the healthcare systems, things like that actually are often very much reflected in how we look at animals. Um, and so the animal rights movement, um, as Hannah said, was a little bit further behind in the US. Um, but during the First World War, for example, um, you know, the animal rights charity of the RSPCA, the Blue Cross, actually supported the US military, the French military in, in looking after their animals. So there wasn't so much of a call for that in the US. So I feel like the Second World War, interestingly, is where the US really came into its own in, in this, this idea of caring for animals as well as using them in the military. Um, so, yes, sorry, Hannah, just kind of jumped in there oh, just, okay. to, <laughs> just to kind yeah. of discuss the idea of the parallels between human history and animal history. Yeah, and it's interesting that you mention um, the U.S. and World War One because a lot of women's charities looking at, like, in terms of suffrage, they backed animal rights because they believed, that, you know, if animal rights, children, protection for children, it can be another cause that we can fold into getting universal suffrage for women. And so a lot of organizations that support animal charities and such as the ASBCA or looking at the Women's Christian Temperance Union which is one of the big factors in driving humane education for children, it was all rolled back into this idea that, you know, if we can get certain groups' rights, eventually politics will turn around to look at suffrage for women. Yeah, completely. And I think um, the other thing I just pick up on just briefly before you dive into Dogs for Defense is just this idea that you know, in in the US and, and with um, the idea of suffrage and women getting the vote and all of these things, when we're looking at animal history, we are looking essentially, we're, we're taking another lens, which has broadly been ignored in historiography. So when we're looking at military history, we often began, you know, we looked at it through the eyes of white men, because they were predominantly the people who wrote the history of war. Then we started to look at more marginalized histories, such as those of enslaved peoples and women. And animal history, is really just another sector of widening the lens in that way. So we try and place ourselves in the position of animals to understand their experience, because that can teach us a huge amount about the human experience. You know, the more we understand about war, the more we understand about military and society around it at the time, you know, the greater it is for everybody, essentially. And although you might not be interested in, you know, dogs in war, actually, and you're just interested in tanks and guns. Well, how did that even get there? And how does it all link together? Because we know these things don't exist in a vacuum. So yeah, totally understand that. Over to you again. And so Dogs for Defense was formed in January of 1942. And it was formed by a woman named Aileen Erlanger, who was a AKC registered poodle breeder. And now I'm mainly bring out the idea of the AKC because I think that's what people think of when they think of dog culture in America. You think of the American Kennel Club, you think of Westminster. And the interesting thing is that the AKC was not officially affiliated with Dogs for Defense. The AKC would use money at dog shows and would raise funds for Dogs for Defense, but they never really sponsored the organization, which is interesting because the founders, including Erlanger, of Dogs for Defense were all big names in the dog world. They were all big names in the American Kennel Club, whether they had been breeders, showmen, judges, etc. It was really the cream de crop of dog fanciers that formed this organization. And when you look back to American dogs in World War I, we did have dogs in World War I, but we didn't have this idea of a dog army that you had in World War II. And Erlanger actually wanted to have a dog army in the American involvement during World War I, albeit our very brief involvement during the war. And so um, she actually tried to draft a bill in Congress that would have made funds for appropriating and raising a dog army in the U.S. And it was denied on the behalf that they wouldn't have the support. And so instead, we just sent a lot of dogs over for the Red Cross service and things which eventually had the Red Cross taking out articles and newspapers saying, stop giving us your dogs, we have too many. And so after the attack in Pearl Harbor, 
Erlanger realized that dogs can be useful in the war effort somehow. In an article with Roland, Roland Kilburn for the Chicago Sun, she basically stated the dog must play a part in this game. You know, she explained how she'd seen the work from other countries using dogs in their armies and their military for years, including in World War One by French and Britain and Germany and their army successfully. And she knew that the American dog had to pay, had to play some kind of part in this war effort if America was going to be successful. And so she really took a gamble that the American people would want to and be willing to donate their animals. And on the 13th of March, 1942, that is when the U.S. dog is actually recognized for military service for the first time by the United States Army. And it started off with a crop of about 200 dogs that were to be trained by Dogs for Defense and sent to Bougainville. And their debut did not go well at all. The dogs were skittish. They were scared. They reacted immediately to the firing of the guns. They forgot commands. It was doggy chaos, basically. And so the military really kind of was just, in July, they were thinking, it's just going to work out. Are these dogs going to be able to serve? And is this organization going to be able to procure the necessary training ideas and things to be able to send dogs into these um, hostile forces and not have the dogs collapse upon themselves? I have a question for you, Hannah, if, I don't, if you don't mind. And it's, mm-hmm. it's a bit of a chicken and an egg one, really, in that I know that the use of animals and dogs had been wasn't just new to World War II. They go back in history. But did the military come up with ideas of how they think they could use dogs in a wider capacity? Or did the dog owners and people like the Dogs for Defense suggest to the military, here's where we think they may be able to help you or was it a question of kind of experimentation finding because obviously the the guard dog idea isn't new but in terms of other things patrolling i mean i'm just wondering which which side instigated it or was it kind of a meeting across from the two sides it seems to me like it was much more of a meeting across the two sides in the beginning when it was um just you know, ordinary civilians being drafted into the military because they had some amount of dog experience to training, it was, that's when you kind of get the really bad results of Bougainville, is because they're not being able to train the dogs for military situations. And so in July of 43, you see the TM, the technical manual adapted for training of military dogs, and it's the TM-10-396. And so that is written with Erlanger, but also in conjunction with the quartermaster department, which oversaw dogs for defense, because it's still seeing the over um, the donation of horses and things, even though the U.S. is so far past using military horses right now. And so by writing the TM-10-396, you're getting ideas from the military, but also from Erlanger in terms of looking at, you know, this is how dogs think. This is how dogs respond well in terms of stimuli and things and positive reinforcement training. So it's really kind of a joint effort from both sides to create the American military dog. It's military um, officials having to learn more about dog psychology and things and how to properly care for a modern dog and its dog fanciers having to really learn about how to win a war, basically. So this this is... is this is, um, I was just going to say, this is something that's come up, I think, multiple times this week. It's the idea of the military relying on civilian expertise. And actually, this brings us to a much wider topic in warfare, because actually, there were many, many areas where the military had to rely on civilian expertise. And, you know, oftentimes, we might think of whether it's like in like mining operations, whether it's like electronics, the development of sound technologies, all different kinds of things where they brought in civilian experts. And I think animals in war and dogs in particular, which are still used now, you know, they're still used as working animals. Probably out of all animals, they're the ones that we think of, I, I certainly think of as working animal more than any other. Um, and so it's so interesting to to learn about the cooperation and the learning techniques between the military and civilians, because that that blend doesn't always go well. <laughs> you know, like that can be quite, quite a lot of friction there. Mm-hmm. And I think it's interesting because one of the things that the dog, when Dogs for Defense was creating the manual and the technical manual, when they were really looking at how dogs could be used 
they borrowed at least some from Colonel Tom Richardson and looking at his kennel during the First World War and his experience with first beginning with his Airedales training and then going much larger into looking at how dogs were used so successful in the British lines during the war. And so it's neat to see the Americans saying, you know, maybe for once we don't have all the keys in our basket, we should look to our neighbors and say, you know, this is how we can use dogs. This is how Britain and France use dogs really well during the First World War. Let's see what we can mimic from them and put like our American spin on it, basically. <laughs> and so in total, originally when Dogs for Defense formed, they asked for about 200,000 American dogs to be donated, which of course was a pretty impossible goal. And so they eventually ended up getting about 20,000 dogs donated by the American public and around 10,475 actually served. Now, when you donated your dog, as I mentioned before, you had a questionnaire that you had to fill out and there were actually some specifications to donate your dog. Your dog had to be at least 18 inches at the shoulder and had to weigh a minimum of about 45 to 50 pounds. And so that ruled out immediately all the tiny companion dogs or maybe puppies that hadn't had their growth spurt or maturity yet. Your dog, you had to be able to say that your dog was not storm shy because they didn't want any dogs that would be fearful of the gunfire, artillery fire, et cetera, going into the military. Your dog could be aggressive, but it was a certain aggressive that the military wanted to be able to hone because even though they didn't want to train purposely attack dogs, they still wanted dogs to show some sort of fearfulness around strangers and to be able to act accordingly. And so for owners who had their dogs sent back to them as part of about that 9,000 that were not taken, most of it was because a lot of the owners lied about their dogs not being storm shy or their dog was too ill or their dogs were simply far too aggressive for them to even allow to be let out of the crate to have the veterinary examiner handle them. They're like, yeah, this dog's a liability. Please take it back. <laughs> and so one thing that it's really been interesting is all this idea of, you know, why are you going to donate your dog? Don't you love your dog? Why would you let your dog go off to somewhere where it could be killed? And there are actually a lot of different reasons. And so the Dalmatian in the bottom corner is Tally Ho Hanna. And Tally Ho was owned by W.M. Hanna out of Nashville, Tennessee. And Tally Ho was actually a gorgeous Dalmatian, a very well represented of the breed. And normally the military did not want Dalmatians because of their coloring would give them away. And so normally for dogs like Tally Ho, they may have stayed stateside guarding factories and things with the Coast Guard or guarding different munitions plants. Because as I think you might see in Britain, not all of the dogs went overseas to Europe or the Pacific Theater. Most of the dogs actually stayed either with the United States Coast Guard when they enlisted or they stayed stateside looking at like the different munitions factories and things to guard. And so Tally Ho was donated because their owner believed that even though they loved their dog, they wanted to do something to help the war effort. And for Butch, Butch was actually donated by his um, owner, Bud. And Bud knew that he had to do something for the war effort. And so he saw that his brothers had joined up as an Air Force pilot. His mother was working in the defense plant. His father was working another state away for a different defense plant. So this 14-year-old boy decided he had to do something to help the war effort if the rest of his family was pitching in. And so he was going to donate his dog, Butch. And so Butch went to the war. And the neat thing is, is that when you donated your animal, um, communication with the handler that served with that particular dog was slim. You really had to get lucky in terms of the handler realizing, hey, this is who donated Butch. And so Butch's handler, Andrew um, Heard Jr., was actually able to make contact with Butch's family, the Fries, out of Rockford, Illinois, and actually sent the Fries a few pictures of Butch and Andy while they're in the service, one of which is here. And so it's nice because they were able to keep up, keep updated on Butch until he came home. And then they wrote a joyful letter to Andy when Butch finally came home, thanking him for taking such good care of their dog. Oh, I love that. And also, um, when you mentioned the Dalmatian, I was thinking, 
and and somebody mentioned about the work that the veterinary corps had to do to really like train up and like buff up on on dog care right but obviously you know as we know pure breed dogs generally have a bunch of health problems or they certainly are more vulnerable to specific things so was there any requirements on apart from obviously spotty coats and like bright pink poodles was there any requirements from the military on the types of dogs because i know during the first world war they were quite strict and the british were quite strict on what kind of dogs that they actually wanted because they chose a bit like horses dogs that had super good characteristics for sentry duties for messenger duties and stuff yeah so originally um dogs for defense almost played slightly kind of like doggy eugenics and they believed that purebred dogs were the ultimate dog that you wanted for the war effort. Because it was a belief that, you know, their superior genetics, being bred for a certain task, would make them a lot better on the battlefield or better guarding factories and things, rather than a mixed breed mutt where you may not know their heritage and makeup. Unfortunately for military, during this time, there was only about 50,000 or so purebred dogs in the United States. And so the cream of the, so finding specifically purebreds was a lost cause. And so they then eventually opened it up to mixes, but the military did eventually settle on a certain list of breeds they thought were the ideal, either purebred or mix, including the German Shepherd, the Malinois, which we think of the traditional military dogs today, you see a lot of Dobermans during this time, boxers. If you were looking at dogs who would station out at Camp Rimini in Montana, part of the sledge dog program, you wanted big fluffy ones like Newfoundlands, St. Bernard's, even though Huskies were a relatively new breed for the American Kennel Club, they wanted Huskies, Samoyeds and things, things that could pull sleds and stuff and be able to deal with supposedly Arctic temperatures. And so you wanted, um, in the end, the military, I think, was just kind of like, we have an idea of the dogs that we want, but as long as your dog meets these minimum requirements in terms of weight and height, we'll accept them. They were also very selective on taking in female dogs because they didn't want to deal with the puppies. And especially at this time where spaying and neutering isn't as common as it is today, they didn't want to deal with puppies if two unaltered dogs mated. And they also believed that female dogs would have been easier frightened than male dogs. <laughs> I mean, talk about parallels to human history. I know. <laughs> Which there's also the irony, because if you look at the handlers that are serving with the dogs, they're all men, because they believed that women shouldn't serve with the dogs in the war effort on the front lines, which is ironic considering a woman founded Dogs for Defense. <laughs> but if you look back at dog donations, the other, um, unfortunately, this little letter in the bottom corner of your screen written by a young boy named Walter says, I don't, I didn't want my dog to go because I never signed up for him. He's explaining that his father donated his dog without the young boy's permission. And so some dogs were sent kind of unwillingly. It was either... Oh, just move on from that now. Otherwise, I'm going to cry. I've never <laughs> come on the show yet. No, don't, don't, no. Move on from that really quickly. I don't want to hear about little boys, little girls. having. <laughs> oh, no, I can't deal with that. <laughs> to recover. Um, they also used, in terms of at least newspaper articles and things, you're using a lot of anthropomorphization to kind of appeal to dog owners. Mm. So for the newspaper article in the front to avenge his master's capture by the Japanese, they're saying that that's the reason that Towser is donated from Indianapolis. It's because his master was captured by the Japanese is now held in, held in a prison camp and Towser just has to go avenge his master's capture and save him. Of course, we know that's not true. The dog doesn't understand that his master is gone and it's being held captive, but it makes for a really good news story for people to kind of glob on to. And I, I so, wanna, uh, just to jump in, mm -hmm. um, Frank told us yesterday about the types of trainers wanted for the pigeons. They had to be well-kept, smart, and so and so. 
the handlers for dogs. I mean, I imagine that's an absolute minefield because you want obviously you want people who have an empathy for animals and are good with animals. You don't that that's a clear requirement. But the and yeah, but at the same time, you don't want someone who then gets so attached to the dog they can't then have make the dog do its job. So how on earth was that balance with with the just between the affection and getting the job done? Because you know, I know people who serve with, with dogs now, they're police handlers, they are very close to their animals, but at the same time, if you're for example a bomb dog, you have you have to let your dog go into a dangerous environments. So how did they weed out and, and train the, the handlers? And I think that's actually a really interesting point because when they begin to recruit handlers, for one thing, as I mentioned you weren't allowed to have women working with the dogs in any type of capacity. And so for the dog world this time, and especially, and still considering, I would still argue now, a large amount of those who are in the dog world and who work with dogs on a daily basis, it's still a very feminine job. And so that rules out 50% of the US population right there by not allowing women to work with the dogs. And so originally the military, um, recruited people who would have experience either with dogs, whether it be kennels, judge, you see a lot of either retired or defunct AC, AKC judges going into the military as trainers and things or as handlers. Those who might have had been breeders would go as well. But they also began to look at anyone who had served on a farm, even if they'd had experience maybe with horses and things, they're wanting you for that animal experience. And then it eventually became the idea of once you get the technical manual published in terms of how to train the dogs effectively, but it's not just training, it's how are you feeding your dogs at a certain time? How are you grooming them? How are you giving them affection? Then you're starting to recruit based on this person is someone I think that I can mold into the perfect dog handler. It's someone that will understand the classroom etiquette of what we're trying to teach and will apply it practically into the field. Because for dogs, they normally had two handlers that they worked with. And it was the belief that the dog would get used to those two handlers, but also refuse affection and attention from the rest of the company. Because you wanted your dog to be able to bond with the people that it was serving with and not accept attention or pets from the rest of your unit. But when you um, mentioned about kind of the idea of animal lovers, you know, emotion just came out. You couldn't help but getting, you couldn't help but forming a bond with these dogs, which is when during the second battle of Guam in 44, um, 43, 44, I'm bad with dates. Um, you see when the 25 dogs are killed during the battle, men are crying because they become so bonded to these animals. And so I think it's something that the loss of the dog, they're realize they're showing human emotion because it's not just the loss of a pet, it's the loss of a soldier. It's someone that you serve beside, even though they had four legs and a tail, you still went through the same motions of training with them, boot camp with them, et cetera, just like you would a human soldier. And so I think that they couldn't help but get attached to the animals that they served with and when the dogs were able to discharge and go home, that's why you see a lot of the handlers writing to the former owners of the dog saying, you know, my name is Jim. I served with Rex in on Iwo Jima. Rex saved my life. Can I adopt your dog? I will pay for all of the expenses and things. And most of the time, the owners were like, yes, you can have the dog because of how much it meant for you. That's amazing. That is so amazing. And I, we touched on the idea of, um, you know, animals being really, really important cog in, in keeping morale of, of fighting troops up. And especially, I imagine, when you're so far from home. So this is particularly maybe prevalent um, for, um, I think it's Paul mentioned earlier, for the US being relatively removed from the war, um, you know, up until a certain point. But even still, even after, you know, they entered the war and, and after Pearl Harbor and all the rest of it, still majority of people living in such a vast country probably didn't have that connection and so when they did go up and sign up to war to have that sort of touchstone to home that dog that came from America with them you know that that's a huge thing um and I and I know from my work with looking at horses and between horses and um, soldiers that the actual 
the, the actual decisions that these animals made on their own, trained or not, that these they're sentient beings and the decisions they made Make or break. Your your uh, your microphone's gone weird again, Lucy, like it did earlier. Having problems with microphone, you've gone robotic again. Try. Try. Uh. Uh. No, you you have to drop out. No. You're... Okay. Well. We we love when we have technical problems, but um, Hannah, we can carry on. Well, Lucy will come back in again because I'm I'm, I'm caught, we're we're all throwing so many questions at you. I feel you you you're, you're going to struggle to get through the presentation. But let's let's look about what we've got on screen now. But we we're just fascinated people. That's that's the problem, Hannah. <laughs> that's totally okay. I love when people get excited about this. It makes me happy. Hey, how's that? Yeah, you're that's back. Good. Lucy's back. Good. I'll hand over to Hannah anyway. I was just I was just yeah. wrapping. <laughs> And so, Lucy, you mentioned about how you didn't, you could never imagine giving up Ivy during the war effort. And the good thing for you is that you wouldn't have to, because there was a thing called the War Dog Fund. And this was started in 1943 out of, from James Austin in Texas. And it was the belief that for dogs that couldn't be given away, whether they're too small, whether they be too young for puppies, maybe they didn't meet the specific weight requirement like private wacky we have over here on the other side of the screen or you just couldn't part with your dog you'd actually be able to make a monetary donation whether in funds would have started at a dollar all the way up to a hundred and your dog would have received either a rank in the navy or the army depending on how high of a monetary donation that you gave and so for instance this little boy who's nine years old his father was too old to go to war after fighting in the First World War. Their dog was a good helper on their farm, and they couldn't do without the dog. And so instead, the boy sent in one dollar to make his dog top a soldier war dog. And so you would have gotten a nice little sticker like you see right here. You could have hung on your window. Your dog would have gotten a neat little licensure tag that said War Dog Fund for their collar. And it was another way that you could have helped out the war effort if you did not want to part with your precious pet. And this is where you see children really getting involved, which I think is really neat. A lot of children, if they didn't want to donate their dog, and now some did, but you also could have been like Nancy Broomhounder out of Ann Arbor, Michigan, who was the official recruitment person and Private Wacky was the official recruitment dog for the War Dog Fund for that area. So anyone in the Ann Arbor area Ann Arbor area near Nancy would write to her and say, I want to get my dog certified in the War Dog Fund. What do I do? And she would reply back saying about sending a little questionnaire about how much money they wanted to donate. And, and here was the, um, here's the ranks that your dog could get depending on your monetary donation. And the War Dog Fund was really started to defer cost for the actual upkeep of these dogs because it cost about $11 per dog to be able to do veterinary care, shipping, training and things. And as I found in Fairfax Downey's history of Dogs for Defense, the War Dog Fund ended up saving the US government about, I think it was between two to $3 million on upkeep for these dogs, which is pretty cool. Yeah, that's a whole lot of money. And so the neat thing is, is the War Dog Fund was not specifically nominated to dogs. You could also enlist your kitty cat or your turtle or your parrot. But the thing that honestly made me smile the most is that a lot of cat owners were angry that their cats couldn't be war cats. And so they started the War Cat Club in which they would donate money for the War Dog Fund but their kitty cat would get a rank in the Navy or the Army, depending on the amount of money donated. And so Sergeant Tibbs right here became a sergeant in the Army after his owner donated, I think, about maybe $20 or so was the rank for sergeant. And so it wasn't just dogs that were able to enlist in the War Dog Fund. It was cats, parrots, horses, anything with fur, feathers skin, et cetera, if you wanted to donate for your animal to help the greater goal of dogs for defense, you were able to. 
And it also does that same thing as the famous frying pans and saucepans for Spitfires in Britain that we now know that they didn't, you can't make Spitfires out of old frying pans and, and, and colanders and things like that. But the point is, is that Mrs. Smith or little Johnny who had sent off a frying pan, put it in the, you know, the, the, the cart that came down your street. Next time you saw a Spitfire flying over, you felt that your frying pan had gone to part the tail of that. So this is the same kind of thing on a wider scale as making sure everybody's feeling part of the war effort. If, if the people at home are close to the people overseas, then the, you've got this bond and connection there. So it, it, it is serving a practical use and it is actually raising money. As you said there, $2 million is, is a huge amount towards the, the training up of these dogs, but it's also just creating a sense of participation. So I think Lucy is a social historian as well. You can understand the importance of the of everybody's morale being be part, part part of something. And I think that's what the Second World War has that perhaps the first doesn't have in wars since, is that sense of everybody in it together because the cause is completely understood. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of what I still haven't really thought about, like what my dissertation is going to be in terms of thesis or anything. But I think that's another thing that drew me to Dogs for Defense is that you see, for the US especially, you know, we think of Victory Gardens and things, the scrap drive, you know, collecting, carpooling and things, these different ways to help the war effort, but you don't think about, I could donate my dog to the war effort, or if I don't want to send my dog, I could give money in my dog's name, and the dogs that are actually going to go overseas can get helped out by this monetary donation. And Dogs for Defense, one of their slogans was actually raising, um, donate dogs or raising dollars. It's a really clever bit of publicity. I mean, I mean, it's just really, really good and, and perhaps less well-known type of propaganda. You're raising money for the military and two to three million dollars. That I mean, that's that's a lot. Um, and as you said, Paul, it just gets it gets people involved and it gets people behind. But you know, these dogs were also playing a very vital role on the battlefields. Um, I don't know if you're you're going to kind of touch on this later, but the kind of roles that they were doing, like sentry work you've mentioned what else were they kind of if that's coming like just ignore me but i'm just super interested in that <laughs> yeah it'll um i'll talk a little bit about when you get into like the propaganda and things but so it would have been sentry work you would have had scout dogs messenger dogs and which you would have seen in the first world war and so being training dogs to be able to run messages put in their little collars and things as um frank may have mentioned yesterday with his pigeon program Dogs were trained to carry carrier pigeons in little baskets, which is adorable. You would have had, I think it was two pigeons to a basket. And the dogs were trained to be able to move them across the lines. You would have also had Red Cross aid dogs, meaning that the dog would have either been able to find wounded soldiers and alert someone that someone needs medical attention, or the dog might have had just kind of this instinct to know that if the person wasn't going to make it, the dog would sit and be that kind of mercy soldier that comforting presence in someone's last moments. That's particularly, I mean, for me, that kind of emotional side of their work. It's also, you know, that's a an understanding from the army that that is required, which again is something which I think, you know, looking after your men, not just an, an understanding that something during their last moments, even when they're not, you know, to put it bluntly, useful anymore, but that that was something that they felt they needed to do, which I think, again, is that, so often in military history, we are, you know, talking about people making decisions and wasting life and criticizing. But actually, here is something where they're putting those needs, you know, they're, they're putting things in place to address those needs. Um, so, yeah, that's amazing. And we all anybody who's, you know, even if you're a cat person, not a dog person, Paul, we all know that these animals have instincts. And to be able to utilize that in war, that that's that's pretty crazy, I think. And I, weirdly, that's just it's outlandish, actually. For me, like that sounds like super, super progressive thinking. And so the other, not just the idea of people donating their pets, the other thing that drew me into this was Dogs for Defense had a brilliant propaganda campaign. And I think as someone who just likes kind of cultural history, pop culture and things, this has been so much fun to dig into. Because in 1955, Fairfax Downey wrote the official history of Dogs for Defense, and he mentions that without the interest and appeal of this publicity, far fewer dogs would have been given to us. 
all the media publicity were skillfully employed towards recruiting dogs and raising dollars. And so he's arguing that without the campaigns put behind the writer's war board or the Office of War Information or smaller branches, that Dogs for Defense may not have been as successful because he wouldn't have been able to get the word out without flashy posters, or as you'll see, children's books and cartoons and movies and things showing people that, you know, it's not just what you read in your daily newspaper about why the dogs are needed, but look at this neat little War Dog Fund recruitment poster or this cute little one right here where the little dog is like, maybe if I dream big, I can become, go into Dogs for Defense and be a dog for the army. But it's trying to convince people through art and this idea that your dog is really needed and here are these really neat kind of flashy propaganda pictures to convince you to donate your animal to the war effort. And so probably in terms of propaganda, my most favorite thing that was used to convince people to donate their animals to the war effort is children's literature. And it's something that you don't think of when you think about things written in World War II, especially looking at dogs. Because the interesting thing is that at least for the United States, publishers wanted titles coming out to be really devoid of war content. They thought that children heard it enough from the serials and the radio, or they saw it on the films and things. They didn't need to see it on the shelves at their library or the small little bookstore to buy. But yet, there's actually a good amount of children's literature written about these dogs during the war effort. And what's interesting about these is in terms of not just how it's kind of subtly saying to children, you know, you should donate your dog because the fictional dog in this story is the hero when they come home is that it's all male children that are the protagonist of these stories. And I think to me, it's interesting because it's kind of going back to this idea that even though girls did donate their dogs, Dogs for Defense is still dealing with the military, which is still something for boys and men rather than girls on the home front where they should be more concerned about helping their mothers in the victory gardens and things, or if they want, they can put on their replica wave uniforms and things and pretend that they're in the service, but it's still centering young boys in these um, books and stories, which I think is interesting. Yeah, for sure. And this is another intersection to an area that maybe doesn't get heaps of coverage on, um, when we're talking about traditional military history and it's the idea of gender roles in the war and gender studies. So again, we're seeing animal history, you know, play a part in this and, and helping us to explore more about, about that. Dogs are for boys, being soldiers mm -hmm. for boys. Um, yeah. Where do women and girls, and again, ironic, as you say, because um, Dogs for Events was set up by a woman. And you think about just kind of going back to traditional gender roles, this idea of the pet is that, the pet is really started because of young boys, because you don't want to, them to become tiny heathens basically when they grow up, you know. It's, you don't want boys shooting songbirds and things or throwing cats, stray cats around the things, being cruel. And yet for women, it's the idea of, let's bring a pet home and they can learn how to be mothers in terms of something that's living that's not just like their baby dolls and things. It's, we're gonna dress Mr. Puss and Boots up in this ridiculous little, newborn costumes and then we'll go from there and so you see that too in if there are female characters in these children's books they're often kind of portraying the good wife that's waiting to come home that children were often kind of designated toward in group play is the idea that they're the patient ones waiting for their loved one to come home while the young boys making the sacrifice of donating their dog to the war effort. Interesting that of those four books you put up there, three are written by female authors. So 75% of those books are female, and yet they're also including male characters. So I, I don't know what the statement that's making, but it's just interesting. Mm -hmm. And I think that might have just been big for children's literature, at least at the time, in terms of looking at the demogra the sex demographic of the authors in terms of is it male or female? I think there might have been much more of a female dominated 
mm-hmm. area in terms of children's literature, at least back then. But it is really interesting to think about how the only book in the four that I put up that has a I guess we could call prominent female characters Tommy and his dog Hurry by Helen Josephine Ferris. And in this, the prominent female character is Tommy's younger sister, who ends up spoiling the homecoming of his father because he had trained Tommy had trained Hurry to salute the American flag because Tommy's father is a colonel. And so Tommy's sister ends up spoiling the trick to her class, and Tommy's really upset because of um the fact that the trick was spoiled before their father got home. But the other idea is that in all of these books, except for Valiant Comrades, it's focusing on children. And for at least for Tommy and his dog, Hurry, when Tommy donates Hurry to the war effort, he's rewarded with a puppy. So he's rewarded with something for his sacrifice. In the sequel, The Private Pepper um, of Dogs for Defense by Francis Cavanaugh and Jeeps, A Dog for Defense by Sylvester Watkins, their dogs are rewarded with medals for serving. In Valiant Comrades, which is aimed at much more kind of teenagers, it's much more of a chapter book, maybe ages 10 and up. The dog's actually killed in action and the handler's actually blinded. And so, at the end, he's awarded with one of his dog's puppies to be able to take on as a guide dog. And so for kids, it's this belief that maybe if you donate your dog, maybe your dog will come home with a medal like Pepper or Jeeps, or you'll get a reward in a puppy like Tommy does in these books. So it's kind of teaching children that even though you're upset, maybe something good will come out of donating your animal to the war effort. And the other big thing that I've had a lot of fun with in terms of looking at how dogs were used are the films and cartoons that they've made. And so there were three live action films centered on war dogs. There was the aptly titled War Dogs, which came out in 1942 in November. So only a few months after Dogs for Defense had formed and only a few months after dogs were finally recognized by the military. And then there was Sergeant Mike and my Pal Wolf, which both came out in 1944. And the neat thing about Sergeant Mike is that unlike War Dogs, which used a canine actor for the film, Sergeant Mike is actually using a real donated dog to the war effort. And so Hal Holverstein out of Minnesota donates his dog to the war effort. And when he goes to see the film, he recognizes his dog on the silver screen, taking this role of Sergeant Mike and the interesting thing is that for these two two films, Sergeant Mike and War Dogs, it's both young boys believing that their dogs can be part of the war effort. For Sergeant Mike, it's this idea of the young boy's brother is killed in the Pacific Theater, and he goes down to the recruiting office to get revenge for his brother's passing. But they won't take children, so he's going to donate his dog to fight in his place, and everything's going to be fine. In War Dogs, we see the young um, boy donating his dog to serve as a sentry with his World War I father, who's very downtrodden right now. And so for War Dogs, it's kind of restoring the glory to his father, his World War I father, who really is kind of upset without how his life has turned out and things. And so they ended up saving a factory from a German saboteur. And so it's happy endings for both. And it's also this idea, it's very military focused. Unlike My Pal Wolf, which is where a young girl finds an AWOL army dog, which the funny thing is dogs actually did go AWOL and they did print it in the newspapers as as such. It was escape, it was something like, I remember one headline being like three dogs AWOL from camp. And so they're even using military terms to describe the dogs in camp, which I thought was delightful. But for my pal Wolf, this young girl befriends this AWOL army dog. And even though eventually she has to tearfully relinquish it back to the military after learning what it's trained to do, she gets a puppy as a reward. And so it's kind of going back to this idea for the children's literature that if you give your dog up, either your dog will get glory like Sergeant Mike or 
pal and war dogs or you'll get something in return like a fuzzy puppy like Greta does in My Pal Wolf. So as much as what's kind of coming to me on this front is as much as this is about raising money for um, um, defense for dogs and all the rest of it, I'm also thinking, is this really grooming the kind of the, the use of America to understand and to deal with the post-war trauma, you know, that's going to come mm-hmm. with losing people? And, and as they get older, especially if this is kind of aimed at teens, you know, with the idea that actually... You know, if they're 16, we don't know how long the war's going to go on of actually joining up themselves. You know, it it seems bigger than just dogs is is basically what I'm trying to say. (laughs) They did one um, for war dogs. They would actually plant puppies in theaters for promotions with signs that said, we're going to be war dogs when we grew up. And so for enlisted dogs, at least, they really kind of banked on this idea that if the dog has puppies, once the puppies reach a certain age, we can train them to be the next crop of war dogs. And so at least kind of for this idea of like dogs entering maturity and things, they definitely thought of, you know, what if the war doesn't end? What if the dogs aren't able to return home? You know, what do we do with smaller puppies that may not be at the age range right now, but they may grow into it being able to enter the service. And so the cartoons also have been kind of really fun because they've really shown what and how dogs were trained during the service. The interesting thing about Canine Patrol is that even though it was done by the Walt Disney Company, it's the only um, cartoon done by Disney to actually acknowledge the dogs in the service. Any other cartoon produced earlier by Disney and Canine Patrol actually came out in December of 1945. So after the war was over, U.S. involvement was done, the wars ended, but they still released Canine Patrol then. I don't know if they released it, if it was delayed or if that's just when it had been scheduled to come out. But the other cartoons that Disney did, even though Pluto is not affiliated with Dogs for Defense in any way, you can still see Pluto kind of mimicking what dogs are doing in the service. Like most of the ones have him staying in... Um, an army camp and he's guarding the army camp from saboteurs well dogs would have done that too or he's assigned to a military base to guard it oh real life dogs would have done that too and so disney would have been taking inspiration of what he would have seen maybe in newspapers or from one of the war dog trading and reception centers which was in san carlos california and even though it's a bit of a drive from where the disney studios were in burbank it still would have been something that he may have seen or would have had people tell him about because he actually did the possibly unused letterhead for the San Carlos War Dog Training and Reception Center, which is really neat. I'll throw a picture of that on my Twitter later show because it's just, it's neat how he did it. But there was actually a so-called race for the War Dog cartoons. It was almost like a sweepstakes that every major animation studio wanted to put something out dealing with the war dogs because of how popular it was at the time. I think the one thing I get a lot, which I think Lucy, you might get this too, is that how do you write about animals? You know, you're wanting to write about something that we can't speak. We know the animals do have a certain concept of agency but they're not able to write down their stories and things so what I get a lot of you know what are you using to write about these dogs and aside from archival sources there have been a few memoirs that have been published in the official histories like Always Faithful is by Corp- um, Captain William Putney who was the um, vet- chief veterinarian for a while of the 32nd War Dog Platoon and they served with the U.S. Marine Corps. And so Putney and his team were one of the first dogs to hit the beach for the Second Battle of Guam. And Putney is the reason why they have the War Dog Cemetery out there. Because after their dog, Kurt, had been killed in action, Putney is trying to use his veterinary training to save the dog, but unfortunately, Kurt passes. When he's asked, you know, where do we put the dog? Where do we bury the dog? Do we bury him on the beach? He's like, no, that dog was a Marine. And he deserves to be buried in the cemetery with the rest of the Marines. And so because of Putney, you have the beginnings of that war dog cemetery on Guam because he's 
recognizing what this dog did. He's recognizing that even though it had four legs and a tail, it still served like a soldier and it should be treated as such. And then the other big published memoir that you have that unfortunately is really hard to find compared to William Putney's is Diary of a War Dog Platoon. And this is by William um, Wiley S. Isom. And Isom is going through the motions with the 45th War Dog Platoon at Iwo Jima and Okinawa. And so it's neat to see when you compare Putney and Isom's memoirs is that you see the end of the war really on the Pacific theater through the eyes of these dog handlers, which I think is neat because you see how vital these dogs were in certain situations for um, helping deflect enemy fire. Because as Fairfax Downey mentions in the history of dogs for defense, and also as both Putney and Isom mentions in the ends of the war for at least the Pacific campaign, they mention how, <coughs> excuse me, Japanese soldiers were trained on the dogs because they knew how vital the dogs were for the Americans. And so at least for some Japanese enemy soldiers, they begin to target the dogs before the Americans to get the dog out of the way, to get that alert system out of the way. So before. they're actually almost being used to draw fire away, almost like mm -hmm. as a, that's, that's <coughs> like, yeah, that's brutal. Mm -hmm. but. <laughs> Yeah, because it would have been used in terms of like looking at sentry, to, it would have been the first one out. And so being able for a dog with their hearing, especially to be able to alert the soldiers before the enemy could take fire was such a good thing to have around you. And the yeah. um, Japanese soldiers soon realized that, that the dogs were alerting quickly to their position and things. Which and that. I mean, and that must be, I mean, particularly when we think about Japanese tactics, you know, they, they use these kind of nighttime sort of small parties encircling. Um, so to have the dogs there to be able to hear that, um, I mean, was just invaluable, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the neat thing is that there was a newspaper article about how valuable these dogs were. You know that for any soldier, cigarettes were like one of the prime commodities especially for Americans, in that these soldiers out in the Pacific Theater, in these foxholes, they were willing to um, trade cigarettes and chocolate bars to be able to get a dog to sleep in the foxhole with them so that they know that they'd be okay for another night. <coughs> and I think the other thing that's big is that in terms of looking at dogs and warfare, the secondary literature. And I wanted to bring up doing their bit by Dr. Kimberly Bryce O'Donnell, because if Lucy, if and you and Paul have not read this, I highly recommend it, but it's about the British Civil Dog Defense Organization and the dogs in Britain in World War II. <coughs> and it's neat to see, to show how case, even though we're all familiar un with the unfortunate, the great, what Hilda King terms as the great dog and cat massacre, but what O'Donnell showing that even in the aftermath of these pets being euthanized, Britain is still willing to donate their dogs to the war effort and to still continue what Richardson did during the First World War in having and raising dogs for the war effort. And so that's been honestly really fun to see and kind of see if I can do parallels between what America was doing to what Britain was doing. And there's also um, War Dogs by Michael G. Lamesh is again, American focus, but a really good overview of the American dog in war. It starts with the beginning with looking at the history of just dogs and warfare from Greek Greco Roman times, going up to so um, dogs that were volunteered for the service or mascots during the Civil War, to dog to Sergeant Stubby of World War One fame, and then into World War Two and beyond, looking at the conflict in Vietnam and modern day military working dogs. And the other book by um, Rosenberg is more of like kind of a military collector's guide. And so it's looking at everything that had been produced for military dogs in World War II. So it's looking at all the different types of choke chains that you can buy, the dogs that have worn, the messenger collars you can still buy, but also looking at the different types of propaganda, like Dogs for Defense had 
a waltz and a victory march that you can still buy sheet music for or maybe movie posters that you can still find if you're lucky enough or advertisements and things so it's really kind of those fun things for the sort the person who may be really interested in terms of more of the warfare side of the dog to see you know what exactly is out there that i can buy the it's um the rosenberg book is really fun the dogs for defense victory march <laughs> that, i mean that just sounds like the most ludicrous thing ever <laughs> it's adorable. i need to hear the music um <laughs> So yeah, you mentioned um, you mentioned briefly about sort of learning from the British, or I mean, often my perception, um, and I think often when we're talking about the cultural, social history of, of how we look at the Second World War, often we see America, you know, America won the war, you know, and it is kind of like this idea that we forget about the contribution of other nations. And what's interesting about Dogs at the Fence is actually this is America almost being quite humble and saying we're a bit behind on this and we're, we're going to take some lessons from the British and French on how to use these animals. And for me, that's quite interesting because that seems to kind of just sit slightly at odds with, you know, some of the other attitudes that were going on in the military at the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because during... Oh, sorry. Oh, I mean, I know, but I just want to say thank you very much for what you've said so far. Um, I, the two questions I have right now are one is... Um, why this isn't a bigger story because we know now you know you're talking about children's literature poster campaigns movies the you know war bonds going to taking dogs to theaters recruiting this whole thing there there's no way the u.s government would have done that unless it was really really important this isn't this this is obviously quite high up on their list of things they it's not like oh yeah we i suppose we could use a few dogs if they send them they actually really want this whole program to be a success they completely see value in it so so the first thing is why it's not so talked about today i mean i know we've had war horse and stuff like that and there's valiant about the pigeon but really this whole uh, understanding of the dogs being involved has been has dropped off because You'd think Disney could have made a movie 10 years ago. It, it, it ties everything together. If you can make a war movie that has shooting and battle and guns and dogs and a handler and a handler has a rope, you know, you can put every element in there. So why hasn't it been rediscovered? That's my first thing, and, I, and I'll let you address that in a minute. But also there's two or three questions on the sidebar about whether or not dogs came back with PTS, um, you know, and, and how you would measure that and what – and what things were done. So whether you want to track the PTS one first, then we can kind of move on to the kind of the general understanding of the story. So dogs returning from the war, what did it all go smoothly? I think is the easiest way to answer it. Ask it. Yeah. So um, it went pretty smoothly, I would say. Originally, at least for the dogs in the U.S. Marine Corps, they did not want to discharge them because there was the belief that the dogs that served in the Marine Corps, they're st- serving in hot Asiatic climates that would be a breeding ground for disease in terms of looking at different zoonotic diseases. They believe that these dogs were too aggressive to be returned home. It's honestly the same kind of one argument that you see in the Vietnam War in terms of why the dogs do not come home. But William Putney is basically like, no, I can train these dogs myself to get them to come home. And so he starts a demobilization process which is eventually adapted by the full um, army in terms of being able to retrain dogs for civilian society. And so it's actually a really interesting process. You have to get the dogs used to being pet again by strangers, by multiple people, because if you remember, dogs when they went into the service had a two handler team and that was it. So you have to get the dogs used to being, you know, ears pulled, tails pulled, maybe pet when they're asleep, maybe. Some, probably some things you shouldn't do for dog body language right now were things that they were like, hey, just kind of being able to rile the dog up a bit. And if the dog reacted, wait until it calmed down and then try to do it again. It would have been exposing the dogs to sounds that they hadn't heard in months, probably like traffic sirens, fire trucks, police sirens and things. You would have tried to agitate the dog to see how they would have responded for stimuli if they tried to attack and things you would wait in to see and eventually if it was a simple growl or something that would have been okay so it's reconditioning dogs to return to the mold of a family pet and i guess a lot of that is sorry paul because 
we weren't doing that for human beings, basically. I mean, we, we are now in modern wars. But back then, if you were a GI or a Tommy or a Canadian soldier and the war ended, you were just sent back home. And all those, that five years or more, you'd been told how to kill and thrust a bayonet into someone's chest, if, assuming you were a combat So there's all the other people doing other stuff as well. You're just demobbed. You're back home. You get your suit. You get a bit of paper with your, with your points on it, whatever it is, and you're just thrust back into society. The fact that they are considering how animals would 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 maybe react to noises and being petted differently they're, they're, that's that's something they're getting that humans aren't getting i mean i mean lucy what's your feeling on that i mean it's amazing isn't it yeah it's amazing and that was, that was partly what i was going to say as well is it it's it that strikes me as just a very very modern thing because now when we think about you know we have like dog psychologists you know and when we think about horses because i remember years ago one of our horses fell down a ditch and she was in this ditch all night and she developed PTSD from this, right? Because she was scared of ditches and she was scared of loud noises and she was anxious and she was on edge, all of these kind of things and went through a period of desensitization basically, which is what they did with horses before the war as well. You know, they got them used to the sounds of um, artillery and all the rest of it. And, But the idea of that post-war they were looking to care for these animals to retrain them to be reintroduced to society, that is crazy because, as Paul said, like that's not something that we're even really doing with people, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. never mind the animals. And it's interesting because if so, some dogs, as we know, did come home with some sort of PTSD because it was scary, more scary. And the interesting thing is that at least depending on some counts that I've read, that if a dog became startled or frightened or snapped back, it was the person's fault for startling the dog. It was not the animal's fault. It was you startle, you move too quickly, you startle the dog with your umbrella or something, and the dog barked or tried to growl and snap at you. It's very much of, unless the dog obviously bit enough to draw, to do serious harm, it was more of this idea that I think had been prevalent for a while and is now slowly kind of coming back to the mainstream of what did you do to antagonize the dog? You should have known the dog was a veteran or something and it's your fault that the dog snapped at you or something. So again, we're showing more compassion and humanity here to to animals potentially than we are to people. Mm -hmm. Like... Yeah. Well, my last one for the week <laughs> because Lucy with your dealing with World War II veterans other veterans I have you know my own great uncle who was on sword beats never showed emotion really when he was talking about the loss of his friends the sheep he saw that in, in Combon Plain near Caen minus half its face because it had blown itself up on a landmine was when he would start crying every time he'd start talking about it, it was a, so so there's a there's a there's already a history of humans being able to uh, show emotion, understand emotion more with animals than they can with each other. So it does kind of make sense. It, in a, it, a weird it does way. make sense. And I think when Hannah mentioned earlier, when we're looking at um, so it, but writing animal history is really difficult because obviously animals can't write their own story. So a lot of the time we rely on memoirs. And one of the things that's quite difficult to do is we have to strip this emotion out because people are incredibly emotional about talking about animals in war because and my view on this is that they stand for innocence, they stand for virtue, they stand for good things. Animals aren't political, you know. They are not. Um, they are not out to cause harm in any way. They are dragged into a war. But I think what's interesting about this the the, the dogs for defence situation is that actually these animals have been volunteered, but then we're actually kind of putting. Um, we're personifying them and saying they want to serve. We, we're very like, and especially with the films, you're talking about the books. It's like these are dog heroes who felt like it was their duty. Um, and so there's so much to dig into there about what that tells us about the society at the time and, and how that reflects on people. Yeah, it's, I think it's a really interesting subject, Hannah. There, there's so many rabbit holes. I mean, when you said earlier, Hannah, about that, that the dog you showed that it, it wants to go and take revenge on the Japanese for killing it. I wonder whether we'd have done a similar kind of campaign for a younger brother, human being. Would we have? Would there have been a poster about a British army soldier who's and Fred is joining the army to, to uh, avenge his brother who was lost at Dunkirk? I don't think we'd have seen that with mm-hmm. human beings. Although someone might say, "No, yes, there was a poster in 1943, Woody." But it's interesting that with animals, we're we're projecting stuff on them that they can't possibly deny or uh, 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 say, "Yeah, yeah, that's exactly how I feel." It's it's. It's a fascinating um, deep dive into the psychology of how humans were putting feelings about war and patriotism and duty through the eyes, the eyes and the characters of these 
fictitious, fictitious stories, these movies and these cartoons and posters. There's a whole show in that. There's a whole show in, in, in that, I think. And I think it's fun because you, going back to what you and Lucy said about this idea of the dogs and the soldiers, that the owners really capitalized on that. Like they sent their dogs Christmas cards, candy, presents into um, the training and reception centers. The quartermaster department got so flooded with letters, they eventually said, unless something happens to your animal, stop riding us. Assume that the dog is okay, because we cannot keep up with the amount of mail that we have from owners just asking if their dog is okay. And this brings me up to my favorite, probably one of the favorite newspaper clippings I've ever found out of a San Francisco paper. A woman had gone into the local Dogs for Defense recruitment station and her dogs may have been stationed at San Carlos, California, which is one of the local, one of the five war dog training reception centers. The others were in Front Royal, Virginia, um, Fort Robinson, Nebraska, Helena, Montana, and Cat Island, Mississippi. And yes, it actually was called Cat Island. But this woman goes into the local branch in California and asks, I want my dog to come home for the weekend. And the, per the, um, Volunteers like, you know, we can't do that. Your dog's on an army base now. Your dog is being trained. And she's like, well, the regular human GIs get to come home for weekends and go on leaves. Why can't I bring my dog home? And so it's interesting because you see these owners, whether it be women, children, men who are donating their dogs, they're using the idea of the dog as a soldier. Even when the, when the dog hasn't even entered you know, it's assignment yet. It's immediately, mm. I don't aim my dog to the war effort. My dog is now a soldier and I'm going to brag about it. And I think that's the, the point you kind of started with, Hannah, about this. There had been maybe this idea that anybody who sent their dog to the war was just, oh, well, who cares? It, they were deeply involved. They loved their <laughs> pet. It was a, it was a, 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 they were conflicted about whether or not to send their rover spot fido off and yet when they did they were writing letters to them and thinking they might come home on leave there's there's a lot there's a lot to investigate there just that, you know I, I can't as i said i i mean my cats i i was joking when i said i would send mine off the wall i love my animals to bits mm -hmm. and like mm -hmm. but i can't imagine being in a situation where i would consider sending off my pets for the war effort I, it, and that's where as much as people like myself and Lucy and yourself study study conflict and work, we, we were never there. We can't understand what it would be to be like in 1939 with war cloud gathering and how I can't imagine myself being in a situation where I would send off my my beloved pet to the war effort. And and Lucy, I think we, we all we all follow your 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 uh, your um, adventures with Ivy. And I think you know, I think you you as you said, you couldn't send Ivy off to war. Could could you? No, but I mean, I don't know. We None of us know what we would do in, in that situation. And I think when it really comes to it, this is like, you know, you never really, people say, oh, you know, I would, I would have volunteered to go to war and all the rest, but nobody really knows, or I would have been in the French resistance or whatever it is. Nobody really knows until it gets to it. And so in some ways, it, in some ways it doesn't surprise me because there was such a fever of people wanting to do their bit. And if, you know, volunteering a dog made you feel that you were contributing in some way and I think the the basically the dog war bonds thing was absolute genius you know um because it allowed everybody to get all their animals involved and that's just a really really clever way so in some ways it surprises me I don't know in other ways you know if you learn and the more you study World War II it doesn't surprise me because it's just no, exactly. <laughs> one last question Hannah then we will be is that was there any kind of this is a really bizarre one so just slap me if it's, it's a, <laughs> of any kind of stigma if you if you lived in a in a street and there were five houses in that street that all had pet dogs and four families all sent off their respective dogs and the one family decided not to send off their animals were that were they, you know, did, did, were they were they stigmatized was there kind of i mean that's another weird one you know if they, you were felt pressure because everybody else was you know, that that's is there, is there any kind of information about that, do you think? So I haven't found anything about stigmatization in terms of if a dog owner wanted to donate their dog versus the family down the street that didn't. I'm still hoping I could find something in a newspaper or scrapbook about some schoolyard fight where little Jimmy got in a fight with Tommy because Tommy said Jimmy's dog yeah. wasn't a real soldier or something. 
something that like children always fight about. But in terms of stigmatization, I haven't found anything at all. Oh, I also, sorry, even indeed, like um, any kind of animal charity or something saying this is morally objectionable to send animals off. Someone said that in a sidebar is that these dogs were volunteered. They weren't, you know, that they, they, they didn't actually sign the bit of paper with a paw print. It was their owners that sent them off there. So whether or not any kind of charity or body said, this is not right. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be enlist, in, enlisting against their will animals. Is, I mean, did that ever happen? That's the thing that I think I have not found record on. I think what has surprised me the most that I have not found record on. And I thought, going in, I thought that this would have been something that would have been morally opposed. But mm. humane societies were backing it and saying, you know, we have dogs that haven't been adopted. Maybe they can go to the war effort. Well, in terms of if they needed dog donations, humane societies were like, you know, here's three dogs that we have that we think might be good for the war effort, take them. That's crazy. That really surprised me. I think with horses, it's different because at the time, even still the Second World War, they were still very much working animals. And particularly in America, as, as we touched upon before, they had this culture of, you know, the cowboy culture with horses. So there were less pets. But with dogs, mm -hmm. I mean, I guess, though, you know, many breeds, they're working breeds anyway. So maybe there's an element of that in you're actually reverting to what they originally were bred for with dogs. I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think your work, Hannah, I mean, it's, A, it's very important to understand the role of dogs, but I think it's also shedding a light on 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 us, on psych, on, on just the human behavior. It's it's more than just about dog. This this is a lot about duty, as we said earlier, morale and and participation. And the examination of dogs is a is a way of really putting a spotlight on the how how the USA was functioning throughout the war years. And the same thing could be done from Britain or Australia or other countries, because it is you know, you know, they say you know people can be judged. People look like their 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 dogs look like their owners, and you can tell countries by the way the type of pets they have. And little French little yet yeah, poodly dogs by sophisticated <laughs> Parisian women, that kind of thing. There's lots of things that we think we read about society by a society's connection with their pets. And I think this subject is 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 highlighting a whole lot of psychology about how countries view themselves when they're going to war. So I think there's lots of work to be done. I'm very grateful that you're doing it, Anna. Thanks. This was honestly so much fun to do. So thank you so much, Lucy, for recommending this. And thank you so much for Paul for being such a wonderful host and for the questions. This has been well, so fun. And so, well, we know you're working on this project. So obviously, you know, you, we're hoping there'll be a book in the future, at least at the very least on this. And um and that we can connect maybe with some other people around the world who are writing about animal, writing or studying animals. So if you have been watching this show, these shows this week, and you are out there somewhere, and animals in World War II is your thing, then be aware there are other peoples out there for whom animals and World War II and First World War is their thing. So let's bring these people together uh, so that we can share this information because there's there's lots of stuff there. So Lucy. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid that this is like this. This four days has come to an end. It's been really good co-hosting with you, and you've been asking some amazing <laughs> questions. I have to up my game because you're really bloody good at what you do, Lucy. And um, oh, thank you, Paul, be presenting with you. Thank you, and thank you so much, Hannah, for sharing your research with us. Um, I'm sure like everybody can follow Hannah on Twitter as well to keep up to yeah. date with what she's doing. But yeah, it's been really great, Paul. So thank you for this week, and I know you've got one more show um, tomorrow as well. Yeah, I'll just mention that. So Kit Chapman is coming on, I think his second visit, and he's talking about some of the wackier kind of animal weapons in World War II. So it's not, it is part of animals at war, but it's more science, and, and, and Kit will bring his usual eccentricity and scientist's approach to it. So that'll be that's at 10 o'clock UK time tomorrow morning. And then that's it, nothing for me for two weeks because I'm off traveling and then back again at the end of July for lots more shows. So folks... It's been great having your company this week and Animals at War. And I think we will return to that subject. We want, there are other things that we haven't covered. The Camel Corps, we haven't covered. We haven't covered um, uh, uh, dolphins that, that can, we haven't discussed, discussed um, migration of birds. There's all, we did do locusts a couple of weeks ago. So there's more subjects we can do anyway. Folks, I'll let you go about your weekend. I will see some of you tomorrow for the show about weird animal weapons. But thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Hannah. And thank you, everybody, for watching. Cheers, everybody. Bye.